Good morning, Steve here again. Um, I hope you're glad, I hope you've been entertained by seeing Richard Dawkins practically on his knees almost begging a senior astrophysicist for a few hundred million extra universes for Christmas um, to save his worthless career which has been shot to ribbons by conventional science anyway. Um, did you notice the senior astrophysicist said uh, reading between the lines, listening to what the senior astrophysicist Wilson actually says. He says, as astrophysicists we continually com come up against these numbers to 17 places which sort of give us the hint that God's there looking at you, uh, uh, metaphorically at least. And the astrophysicists are wise enough to keep it to themselves. They don't talk about it because it's politically bad for their careers and their profession and it's not really their job to talk about God anyway they're really just mathematicians so the senior astrophysicist is basically saying no astrophysicist has been that stupid to um, advocate hundreds of millions of universes to save somebody's career we all keep quiet about things that are a little bit uncomfortable and we just keep doing our calculations and getting our weekly salaries but you Mr Dawkins you're dumb enough to ask for trillions of universes just to save your career I mean that's basically what the man says and Richard Dawkins has always derided religious people for believing in miracles and uh, the tooth fairy and all the flying spaghetti monster analogies and believing in mythical events and deities and stuff like that and here we've got Richard Dawkins uh, presenting the most preposterous most infantile wish of gargantuan size that I've ever heard of I mean I don't think any small child has ever asked for parallel universes to get themselves out when they're called lying to get themselves out of trouble uh, and that's basically what um, Richard Dawkins has done I've got another little video clip made by a fellow called, uh, I think it's Shapiro in China. He makes a, a, f a 40 minute speech shortened down to 10 minutes or something. It's a good watch. And he basically says all the tenets of modern Dork Dawkins neo Darwinism are absolutely wrong. The selfish gene is total rubbish. And he explains why uh, very clearly and very lucidly and very simply. So, really, um, Neo the neo-Darwinist clique of so-called evolutionary biologists, Dawkins was ne which was, Dawkins was never one of those, by the way. They're all turning on each other. There's only a handful left, and they say that Jerry Coyne is seriously isolated. No one takes him seriously anymore, and he's the one that took down Sheldrake, Hancock, and Chopra, apparently with an angry phone call or something. So he's just a verbally violent bully, apparently able to ring people up and make surprise uh, calls. It may be the last hurrah of the neo-Darwinist clique because they're all at each other's throats uh, trying to prove each other purer than the other in the, in the uh, pursuit of neo-Darwinism which has been utterly falsified and I've got this uh, 10 minute um, description of why neo-Darwinism is uh, the idea of small mutations producing all life on Earth, vertical mutations only, um, is explained in great detail. So I'll hand you over to that one too and you can watch that. And you can see how neo-Darwinism is just vanishing as a theory, but it's still going to be coming out of the BBC, of course. Um, but Dawkins hasn't got a leg to stand on, and that's why he ended up pleading in front of this astrophysicist for a few hundred million universes to um, get him out of trouble to rescue his failed career and I, I don't think um, the astrophysicist sort of says he's not Santa Claus to Dawkins you know he's not Santa Claus and he really it's he said it's not even a theory it's just speculation which is a grown-up word for fantasy wishing and this is starting to make virgin birth and returning from the dead look 
strictly boring and scientific compared to please can I have 500 million extra universes. I mean, virgin birth is already doable according to science because they've produced uh, sperm cells from female stem cells. So a woman could self-fertilize now, today. Can be done. Not a problem. Uh, returning from the dead has been happening with um, um, uh, physical mediumship for the last 150 years. It happens in Sydney. There's about six of these people in the whole world that can produce deceased people out of ectoplasm that walk and talk and smell and have recognisable mannerisms which are recognised by people in the audience. Uh, randomly, by the way, you can't plan who's ever going to turn up. But deceased people do return from the dead and make physical contact that's photographable. It's just been photographed in Austria by K. Moog, a German medium. Okay, we're waiting on the film on that. So, so returning from the dead and virgin birth are all distinctly doable in this one simple universe. We really don't need 500 trillion extra universes just to rescue Dawkins' worthless, useless career. Is that enough for today? <laughs> integration of Mendelian inheritance, that is discrete inheritance, with evolutionary theory, and about the same time too, um, Weissman established what was called the Weissman barrier, the idea that the germ cells and their genetic material is not in any way influenced by the organism itself or by the environment. And then something like 40 years later, a variety of people, Julian Huxley, R.A. Fisher, Haldane and Wright, uh, put things together to call it the modern synthesis. So what exactly is the modern synthesis? It's sometimes called neo-Darwinism, and it was popularized in the book by Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, in 1976. Its main assumptions are, first of all, that it is a gene-centered view of natural selection. The process of evolution, therefore, can be characterized entirely by what is happening to the genome. It would be a process in which there would be accumulation of random mutations followed by selection. Now, important point to make here is if that process is genuinely random, then there is nothing that physiology, there's nothing that people like you and me can say about that process. That's a very important point. The second aspect of neo-Darwinism was the impossibility of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. It was miscalled Lamarckism. As I said earlier on, Lamarck did not invent the idea. He assumed it. And there is a very important distinction, particularly in Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, between the replicator, that is the genes, and the vehicle that carries the replicator, that is the organism or phenotype, and, of course, that idea was not only buttressed and supported by the Weissman barrier idea, but also later on by the central dogma of molecular biology. All of these rules have been broken. And that is the subject of my lecture. First of all, are mutations random? Very important book to catch up with what is happening very rapidly in the field of evolutionary biology is the book by the Chicago biochemist um, James Shapiro, Evolution of Youth on the 21st Century. He writes and he gives detailed evidence. He has thousands of references on this in um, his website. It is difficult, if not impossible, to find a genome change operator that is truly random in its action within the DNA of the cell. All careful studies of mutagenesis find statistically significant non-random patterns of change. In other words, there are hot spots in the genome. Moreover, as we will see later on, the frequency with which those changes can occur can respond to what the organism is doing and what its environment is doing. Just to give one example, P-element homing in fruit flies these are DNA transposons that can insert into the genome in a functionally significant way. 
and what has been shown is that they do so with a frequency that is 50% greater in regions of the genome that are related functionally. We don't at the moment understand that, but one possibility is that it depends upon the organization uh. of the genome, the way the DNA is folded and the way in which it is structured uh, <coughs> around um, its proteins. Moreover, not only is it the case that mutations are not random, another major assumption of the modern synthesis is incorrect. And we found that out at the time of the sequencing of the human genome in the year 2000, because the nature report of that sequencing showed that two major groups of proteins, the transcription factors and the chromatin binding proteins, do not show gradual change between species um, of the sequence of the protein, but major domain switching into one protein after another. This is from the report, the 2001 report of the sequencing of the genome, showing domain accretion in yeast, in a worm, a fly, vertebrate, and human, and the stars indicate, that's all you need to take home from this slide, the domains that have shifted around as whole domains, not gradual mutation, one amino acid after another. And as you can see, there are many of them. The same is true for transcription proteins. So my first conclusion is this. Not only is mutation not random, that was one of the essential assumptions of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, uh, but proteins, at least some of them, did not evolve the gradual accumulation of mutations. Coming back to the question of uh, randomness of mutations, we've seen that they're not random, and gradual accumulation of mutations, we've seen that they are not, at least in the case of certain important proteins. Another thing to add to this is that, so far, it has not been shown that that process could, in any case, give rise to a new species. Notice that thousands of years of domestic selection have produced new varieties of dogs, of fish, and whatever, but not of new species. So, my main conclusion here is that the concept of selfishness applied to genes is simply not testable, and now it raises a very big question. Why was it ever thought to be an empirical fact? I think the reason is that the concept of a gene has changed, and it's changed fundamentally during the century from which, well, when Johansson introduced it in 1909, it's when it was defined. And this diagram, taken from a recent article that I published with Peter Cole and two of the others, shows the nature of the problem. There is the direct arrow from DNA to phenotype, which was the original idea. For each phenotype, there was a gene the gene for this, the gene for that. That is obviously wrong. We know, as physiologists, that what happens is that large numbers of proteins and other components in cells cooperate in networks, the biological network, the signaling pathways, the various incubators that enable and restrict reactions to enable it to be possible for DNA, which is used as a template to make those proteins, of course, to interact with the environment to produce the phenotype. And if we uh, look at the definitions here, the original definition of a gene, when introduced by Johansson, was that it was the cause of the phenotype. We now realize, of course, that by defining a gene as a sequence of DNA, that has to be filtered through the physiological and biochemical network. So it is no longer the case that it is the cause of a phenotype. It has to be shown to be a cause and in interaction with, in cooperation with many other components. Moreover, simply by knocking genes out, we don't necessarily reveal function because the network may buffer what is happening. This study went through all 6,000 genes in the organism yeast knocking them out one by one. Eighty percent of the knockouts are silent. So this physiological process of buffering against gene change is general. 
It's usual, in fact. Now, that doesn't mean to say that these proteins that are made as a consequence of the gene templates for them don't have a function. Of course they do. If you stress the organism, you can reveal the function. Again, it is that if the organism cannot make product X by mechanism A, it makes it by mechanism B. And for those who want to read uh, more on this particular aspect of my lecture, David's article in Bioessays is highly recommended. Knockouts do not reveal regulators, and often they don't even reveal function. So what's the origin of the problem? The problem, of course, comes from seeing biology too much from a reductionist point of view. Uh, going from genes to proteins, that arrow, of course, is an unusual one. It's a template, a coding step, and then the various formations of pathways from proteins to subcellular structures, cellular, and all the way up to the organism. And it led, of course, to Richard's statement in the uh, selfish gene, they, genes, created as body and mind. I don't think that's true at all. Um, in fact, I much prefer the statement by the Nobel Prize winner, Sidney Brenner, I know one approach that will fail.